Well, what about alternatives? Everything we've dealt with so far has been perhaps more conventional, um, cardiovascular warm-ups and, and, and so on. But what about, as, as, as Bishop referred to in that table right at the start of this class, what about perhaps non-temperature non um, related um, activities or, or approaches? Well, one of which is what is called post-activation performance enhancement, or often referred to as post-activation potentiation. So let's kind of understand this and see where this fits in. Well, let's take this paragraph from, from a 2019 paper, which is very useful for us. With respect to acute performance enhancements, much attention has been given to the possibility that performance improvement can be achieved through strategies that induce a post-activation potentiation in the working muscles. PAP has been defined as an enhanced muscle contractile response for a given level of stimulation following an intense voluntary contraction, which is measured as the maximum twitch force evoked by supermaximal electrical stimulation. In other words, what they're, they're arguing here is this is much, much more about a neuromuscular response than anything kind of conventionally metabolic or thermoregulatory. And what they're saying is, is this notion of a post-activation potentiation, which is kind of the conventional description of what we're about to get into, um, generates enhanced contractile response following a very, very intense prior muscle contraction. So let's kind of think about how this all, why this might work. Well, they go on to write this. However, the term PAP, has more recently been used to describe a voluntary force or power enhancement after a high intensity exercise based warm up without confirmation by twitch stimulations that PAP was evoked and therefore the other factors that impact muscle function such as temperature, activation, level learning do not underpin the enhancement. That is, it is rarely established that the muscle performance enhancement results from mechanisms that underpin classical PAP. So this is kind of a, a kind of a, a warning that conventionally, you know, in, in terms of the fields of exercise science and also things like personal training um, and so on, there is this convention to call what we're about to see, which is doing a prior contraction uh, subsequent to um, or consequent, subsequent to um, a bout of criterion exercise. Um, we call it post-activation potentiation. Their argument is that is probably not the case. If you cannot demonstrate that actually um, that you've got confirmation of the actual twitch, you don't know in their argument whether it's actually this prior contraction that's evoked the, 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 the response in the criteria in action or something else. And it's just getting the kind of the taxonomy correct. And you can see the difference here. So what they're saying is, is there are two kind of conditions. There is kind of the, the conventional PAP, which is whereby we have absolutely um, used a, a maximal twitch in the muscle. Ideally, you probably electrically stimulated the muscle. And what they show is if you electrically stimulate the muscle, you get a consequent um, response in force output. So what we're showing here this is the change in force from baseline. So this is what happens when you do a, you stimulate the muscle electrically. So you, you know, like um, electrical stimulation to the muscle. And then what you have is, th this is the kind of the, the, the association between the change from baseline against time. And you can see actually there is quite a rapid decline in the um, force, the subsequent force that the muscle can produce. But quite quickly, quite early on, there's a very quick gain. If, however, we use the more conventional approach, which is we don't ratify um, the post-activation potentiation by evaluating um, the, the, the twitch dynamics of the muscle, or, uh, or we, we, you know, we, we proceed it using some other means, which we'll get into in a moment, not electrical stimulation, actually what you see is this more conventional approach, which is that the, the change in force from baseline increases, and it takes around about five to eight minutes to increase, and then it starts to dissipate. So this is different to the notion of temperature-dependent responses. This is about getting neuromuscular responses. 
So let's think about why. Well, the response of skeletal muscle to volitional command or electrically induced stimuli is affected by its contractile history. Neuromuscular fatigue, which can, be brief, which can briefly be defined as the decrease in force observed after a period of repeated muscle activation, is the most obvious effect of contractile history. In contrast to fatigue, which serves, as an impaired, uh, serves to impair force production, there is evidence that contractile history of skeletal muscles may facilitate the volitional production of force, and this is known as post-activation potentiation, which we've been looking at. Although fatigue and potentiation have opposing effects on force production, pretty much as we saw with prior priming, in skeletal muscle, these two mechanisms can coexist. Force output following contractile activity reflects the net balance between processes that enhance force development and those that diminish it. And that's the key. A post-activation potentiation, which is engaging the muscle in a, in a voluntary contraction prior to the criterion exercise, is going to produce fatigue. It's going to produce potentially fatigue in terms of um, some degradation in substrate, but almost certainly fatigue of the neuromuscular system. But, as we can see in this schematic here, as we start to kind of recover, so we might be getting some physiological recovery, what we start to get is we start to actually get um, a gain in the amount of force that's been able to be produced in the criterion exercise. And it's again understanding that the relationship between fatigue and performance. So what you've got here is kind of the, the change in um, what we call uh, regulatory um, uh, light chain phosphorylation and the twitch potentiation. So the one I want you to focus on is the twitch potentiation. Don't worry about the phosphate content. It's the twitch potentiation. So the ability of the muscle to to twitch. So here we've got a titanic contraction that's been induced and the best way I want you to think about this is it's, it's the equivalent of doing a maximal voluntary contraction. So imagine that you're pushing against a resistance, maybe doing a squat and you're trying to push the bar up or you're trying to resist the bar or you're pushing as hard as you can against a wall. It's the equivalent of seeing this titanic contraction that they've done here kind of in more isolated muscle fiber. So here we've got the kind of a 10 second process, but look at the effect that it's had on the subsequent um, force that can be produced. It's really quite significantly increased. That then starts to decline over time, but you, you know, we're looking here over a 250 um, second window, but even, even after three minutes, you're still in a better place than you were prior to doing this pre-activation here. So although this is fatiguing, and that is fatiguing, that, that creates a neuromuscular fatigue, it is clearly beneficial in the subsequent amount of force that the muscle can produce, because it's higher than where we started here. The ideal place, you might say, is, well, I'll do my exercise 10 seconds afterwards, but remember that fatigue is now high. Okay, fatigue is high. And the way we know that, look at the phosphate content. Remember that phosphate, free phosphate concentration increases as a consequence of the splitting of ATP. And of course, we've had to use ATP to initiate this muscle contraction and hold it. So we've got, we've got an energy cost, but the phosphate content starts to decline. And actually, although, it's, although the phosphate content is higher than perhaps where we started, you can see here, after say even after 70 seconds, phosphate content is much better than it was after, you know, immediately after the titanic contraction. And so this is representing your fatigue and this is representing your performance. And it's understanding that balance. And in fact, what we know is if you leave it you know, longer than probably 10 minutes, then fundamentally you've lost the twitch response. Yes, fatigue is dissipated, but you lost the twitch response. But if I leave it for, say, five minutes, I've got a reduced you know, twitch response. This is getting close to five minutes here. It's a lot lower than it was you know, in the first 20 seconds, but I've still got a heightened twitch response with less of a fatigue <clears throat> associated with it. 
So it's about understanding the interplay between, again, fatigue and performance. So let's look at this perhaps in a more practical scenario. And one of the ways that we can do this is um, using um, squatting exercise or, or exercising at percentages of the one rep max. So here we've got some counter movement jump data and we've got pre and post, and we've got two conditions. So what you've got is um, an eight minute rest where they've done nothing, that's condition A. And in condition B, they've, they've basically done a five rep max squat. Now, they've, they've simply um, been asked to hold the five rep max squat. It's not a case of doing repeat squats, they're holding the position. And what you've got to remember is as soon as you hold a position, even though it's at five, five rep max, you're getting neuromuscular recruitment. What we know is the closer you get to the MVC, the maximal voluntary contraction, the greater the motor unit recruitment pattern is, the greater the neuromuscular recruitment, therefore more muscle fibers have been recruited. But this kind of shows the effect of just working at 5RM. Look at the effect on counter movement jump performance, pre to post. That's a really significant increase going from about 49 centimeters as an average, sorry, 48 centimeters, to just about 50 centimeters. And you think, well, that's, you know, it's only a two centimeter gain, but look at the effect of not doing anything. Look at that, falling. So what they've got here is they've got, in essence, torque over time. And so what you can see is it, it, it's, it's kind of the um, representation of, of the, the amount of force being produced over a period of time. So they, they stimulate the muscle. And you can see here, this is pre to post the post activation potentiation. And look at the effect, again, at 5RM, increase the neuromuscular recruitment, a significant increase in the torque that's being produced. And actually, no real effect in this example of the rate of decline. But it shows us it's occurring at the same time point, so we're producing more force more rapidly because we've recruited more muscle fibers. It's not a temperature dependent process, but you can see how that becomes very, very beneficial in an athletic scenario. And then if we go a little bit further and we look at this data set here from, again, from a fairly recent paper. Now, what we have is the left panel, we've got time on our x-axis. This is time immediately after a 10 second isometric MVC. So, this is kind of the gold standard way of perhaps doing this whole body wise. And then what they've got is the twitch peak torque potentiation. So what you can see is that immediately after the MVC, the highest uh, twitch capability is evoked. And as we start to, to move away from that period of time, we lose the twitch response. We in other words, we lose the amount of force generating capacity in the muscle. In the panel on the right, what you have is, 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 is kind of an extreme version of this. this is, panel on the left is basically you've got a, a 10 second MVC, a single MVC. This shows you what happens if you, if you think, well, actually, if I, if I vote more MVCs, I'm going to get greater neural recruitment. Look at the effect. They've done 16 of these. And fundamentally, you get a fatiguing effect on the neuromuscular system. And even after seven minutes, You've got nowhere near back to baseline. You can see early on, look at the benefits up here. One, two, three, there's your post-activation positive potentiation effect. As soon as we go to the fourth and the fifth, look at the effect, we become more and more fatigued. And the recovery intervention here hasn't brought us anywhere near back to where we should be at baseline. So it's really kind of an important message, which is, yeah, you only really need to do one or two of these to get the benefit. Anything beyond that, it becomes detrimental in terms of consequent performance because you create a neuromuscular fatigue. Well, what, is it, what does a post-activation potentiation protocol look like? Well, if we take some data from um, a, a, a meta-analysis, what you've got here is um, effect sizes and we've got them here against rest time. So how long between the post-activation potentiation and the criterion bout of exercise? We've got it in for three groups of athletes. So if we kind of take our 
uh, untrained um, athletes, then there's very little data here. I, I wouldn't, I'd be worried about using this data set to explain anything. It was quite limited in terms of what the authors have got. But take the other two. Take your, your athletes and the trained. What you can see in the athletes is they're producing a meaningful effect. This is a large effect and it's about three to seven minutes after the post-activation potentiation before when you should be doing the criterion bout of exercise. And that's taking into account the fatigue effect and the decline in the twitch response. In the trained athletes, it's about seven to 10 minutes. Still a large effect, so it's, so it's meaningful, but they actually need longer. And it's almost certainly because the trained athletes are able to produce greater um, MVCs than the, than the athletes who are, in this case, we're, we're, we're referring to them being less well trained, still trained, but less well trained. And so the net result is they create a greater fatigue and we end up having to um, have a greater recovery period post-exercise. And then the panel to the, to the right, again, compares our three groups and it's the comparison in terms of the effect on uh, subsequent performance using either a single set or multiple sets. And when they're talking about kind of using multiple sets, they're not talking about the 16 that we saw on the previous slide. They're talking about using um, two to three um, post-activation potentiations. And you can see the benefits here that doing a single post-activation potentiation is probably not as, as beneficial as doing multiple. But doing multiple becomes more beneficial as the athlete becomes more trained. Again, reflecting their resilience to fatigue. So you have to adjust your, your post-activation potential model to the, the type of athlete that you're working with. And we can look at this here. This schematic really is quite nice in terms of explaining this for us. So here we've got our performance curve and we've got our uh, a kind of a PAP curve and we've got our fatigue curve here. And this is the interplay. So what you've got here, here you've got your condition window. So this is kind of where you apply um, your, your peaking, your, your post-activation potentiation. So net, net result is at the point of the peak PAP, which is the point where you've got the greatest neural recruitment, you've got the greatest amount of fatigue. And subsequently, performance is at, it, is at its worst. But now what starts to happen is, look, a smooth, as soon as we go into kind of the recovery window here, notice that you lose the potentiation effect. But as the potentiation effect is being lowered, not surprisingly, we're recovering from the, from the fatigue. And it's that interplay. Yes, I could get the greatest PAP effect here, but I'm highly fatigued. The consequent effect on performance is it's detrimental. Even if I go to this point here and go, okay, I've lost about 50%, I've still got quite a lot of fatigue. I've not gained anything performance wise. And so it's only when you get into this latter window, like seven to 10 minutes post PAP that we saw in the, in the highly trained athletes, where you look like you've lost a lot of the, the papping effect, but because you've, you've, you've re removed a lot of fatigue, you get this relatively small gain in performance. And it's, it's, it, we're not looking for enormous gains. It's about marginal gains. And this is a real good demonstration of getting a marginal gain in force generation. 